Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Barry William Magdalene, your host of the Freedom Series live stream session. And today I'm pretty excited to have Steve Sims on the line. Uh, and I'm curious to know, question for all of you out there. Do you know anyone who's worked with Sir Elton John or Elon Musk, uh, sent people down to see the wreck of the Titanic on the seabed or closed museums in Florence for a private dinner party and then had Andre uh, Beckley serenade them while they eat their pasta? Well, you do now. As quoted as a real life Wizard of Oz by Forbes and Entrepreneur Magazine, Steve Sims is a best-selling author with Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen, uh, he's also a sought-after coach and speaker at a variety of network groups, associations, as well as the Pentagon and Harvard twice. Steve, welcome to the show, mate. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm so grateful to have you. Now, where are you calling in from today? You've got a very distinct accent. Well, the accent will be deceiving. Um, I'm at a, actually a British boy. Um, the funny, away, uh, funny enough, in my early teens, moved over to your side of the planet. I moved over to Asia. Then from Asia into Switzerland, and now I reside in Los Angeles, California. Wow, fantastic. We're having a funny conversation before I'm calling in from my home here in Bali, Indonesia. And uh, I said that it's, it's amazing right now because it's quite quiet. And you said, yeah, many people said that Los Angeles, if everyone was to leave, it'd be a great place to live. Yep. Um, I just want to welcome uh, everyone who's watching this live today, wherever you are, uh, on any of the platforms we're streaming live here. Uh, one of my amazing team members, Rafi, is on the line. He's going to be feeding through all your questions and comments. So please, let's make this next half an hour, 40 minutes, as interactive as possible. Uh, send through your questions, myself and Steve, and we'll absolutely be sure to get an answer for you. And make sure you hit the like button. Let us know that you are watching as well. So Steve, first question I kind of like to ask you, like, where did it start for, for you? Like, you know, you've had some amazing experiences in your life, but how did you kind of, I guess, get started on this journey? Wow. Um, do you know, I can name drop and give you beautiful locations and celebrities and all that kind of stuff. But you know, the funny thing is that we're all the same. We're entrepreneurs and we don't fit until we conquer. And most of the time, entrepreneurs spend most of their early life being aggravated with the way things are done. So they go and find a way of doing it better. That's the entrepreneurial gene. That's the DNA that we've got. So I was a British lad. My family owned a little construction firm. My granddad was on it, my cousins, blah, blah, I'll go into that. And I left school at 15. And my dad literally the following day went, right, you're on the building site tomorrow. So he gave me one day off. And then I started my, my life in construction. And this went on for about six months, getting up at like six o'clock in the morning, uh, or sorry, being on the building site at six o'clock in the morning. I, I honestly thought, as a young teenager, because let's be serious, we're stupid then, I thought I was going to die of sleep deprivation because we were getting up at like five o'clock in the morning to be on a building site at six. I'm coming home at six. I had no life, a little bit of cash, not much. Um, and I thought, is this it? Is this my life? And that's the DNA of an entrepreneur. We question things. You know, why does it have to be this way? And here was my big punch in the nose pivotal moment. I was on the building site and my dad said, look, we're light handed for laborers, which were all the guys that do all the grunt work. And I'm a big, ugly lad. And he went, you're going to have to start bringing bricks up the scaffolding. So I had this like contraption, it's called a hod, that you stick on your shoulder and you bring the bricks up and down the, the ladder. So I went to the top of the ladder and on the scaffolding closest to me was my dad. Next to him, his brother, my uncle. Next to him, my two cousins and then next to them my granddad now my cousins were in their teens my dad and my uncle were obviously older than everyone and then my grand i, I saw my family tree i literally <laughs> saw my lifeline and i was like whoa i was just shocked and so he yelled at me because i was stood there paralyzed and so come tea break time, which was like 10 o'clock in the morning, this is in England and it's raining, it's cold and it's horrible. And we're all in a little you know, caravan with no wheels around a little heater trying to warm up with our cup of tea before we got back on the building site. And I scraggled through everyone and I sat down in front of my granddad. Now my, my family, you know, if you haven't you know, worked it out already from the, from the slight bit of ginger that's left in my gray beard, we're an Irish bricklaying family. So we're not the most, elegant you know group in the in the tool shed 
And so I walked up to my de- granddad, now, and he's, he was like seven, seven, one, big Paddy, big ass Paddy. And I sat down in front of him and I crouched down and I was like, granddad, granddad. And I, I, I remember to the T what I asked him and I'm still today surprised I didn't get my nose rearranged. I said to him, granddad, did you ever think you'd be doing this at your age? And he was trying to drink his tea and he didn't look at me, but he blew into his tea to cool it down. And he went, son, if you don't quit today, you'll be me tomorrow. And I was like, whoa, this, this, wow. this was like 1030. This was a big day of metaphors that were hitting me. So I left the, the hut and I'm like a, you know, stupid little vibrant teenager. I'm like, dad, dad, dad. And he's like, what? And he hated being called dad. You know, I had to call him cuz, but he hated being called dad on the building side. I'm like, dad, dad. And he's like, what? Shut up, what? And I went, I've got to quit. <laughs> and he was like, what? And I'm like, yeah, but you know, I, I went in there and I saw Grant and I was up there on the scout and I saw my granddad and I walked, in, I walked up there and I said, yeah. And he said, if you don't quit, baby. And as I was ranting like an idiot on acid, granddad walked behind me and they looked at each other and my dad just turned around and he said, we're light-handed, you leave Friday. And I went, <laughs> right. And that was it. So between the pair of them, they kind of understood you know, they weren't offended. It made sense to them. Get out there, try something. But I went home. And that's where the shit hit. You see, I don't mind pissing off a seven foot one Irish lad. Oh. But never mess with an Irish mum. So when I got home and my dad told my mum what I had done, she came at me with, you think you're better than us, don't you? And I went, no, 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 no. I just think I'm better than this. I want to try other things. And of course, like when you're talking to an Irish mum, no matter what you're saying, she kept going, you think you're better than us. No, 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 that's not what I said. So sadly, I have to be honest, my relationship with my mum never has been good since that day. I think part of it, yeah, I think part of it, now bear in mind, you know, you gave a little bit of, a, of an intro. In the, I've worked with the Grammys, the Oscars, Sir Elton John, Elon Musk. I've worked with the Pope. You know, anyone big, you know, you can think of, more than likely I've worked with them somehow, some way. I worked with Ferrari. And when I went to England and I was living in Geneva at the time, they would give me, now here's the stupid thing. I own motorcycles. I own about 12. I don't own a car. Okay, I don't want to drive a car. I don't want to be in a car. I don't like cars. I love motorcycles. Working for Ferrari, they used to go, right, whenever you travel, let us know in advance, we'll give you a Ferrari. And I'd be like, nope, nope, it's okay. I would literally rent motorcycles. And so one day I actually landed in England and I went over to the headquarters of Ferrari in in Egham, got a Ferrari and drove it down to my dad just for my dad. Okay, and I went there because he liked sports cars. He saw the car and literally turned around. He went, oh, that's a beautiful Lotus. And I went, uh, it's not a Lotus, Dad. It's a Ferrari. And when I, he was like, oh, and I took him for a drive, forced him, forced him to drive the car, you know, because at the end of the day, it's only a freaking car. Forced him to drive the car. We went home, saw my mum. And my mum, still about 10 years later, even though I was doing well, still gave me the gruff still was giving me the cold shoulder, wanted nothing to do with it. And when my dad went to the toilet, she literally asked me, was I a drug dealer? So that was my pivotal moment that caused me to change. And again, it's the same with all of us. All of, all of us as entrepreneurs, as Joe Polish says, it's aggravated pearls, uh, sorry, aggravated oysters to make pearls. I, I was aggravated and I went upon my journey to try and find out how I could be better. And along the way, like all entrepreneurs, we fuck up, screw up, make mistakes, get screwed over, laughed at. That's the journey of an entrepreneur, but that was the beginning element of it. Wow. Wow. So much um, insight. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that, uh, I guess for your mum, she wouldn't like to be proved wrong. Like she's, she's on a high horse. She's got her opinion. And probably deep down, she's proud of you. Uh, but yeah. I'd like to think so, but we've all got that in our world. You know, that one was quite dramatic because it was my mum. 
Yeah. But we've all had those people in the world that when we turn around and go, oh, I'm going to do this, the first thing they turn around and say is, oh, that will never work. And those are the people that are scared that you're going to do it to prove to them how inadequate that they can, that they can't. Yeah. And I think deep down over the years, and as I've got older and I've gone through periods of resentment, periods of sadness, and maybe now as I'm 50, don't know what I am, 52, 53, maybe reflection that I'm in now, I kind of feel that she feels that maybe I'm showing her a world that she maybe wanted to live in, but didn't think it possible. Mm -hmm. And isn't it amazing how many people we meet that imposed our own parameters on themselves? Yeah. And as entrepreneurs, as my wife says, you know, if I was a superhero, my superpower would be ignorance because mm -hmm. I just go and do stuff and I yeah. fail and I get hurt, but I go and do it again. And ignorance and stupidity is a beautiful gene within an entrepreneur because sometimes we need that complete obsession, self-focus and ignorance to the fact that it's going to go wrong. Yeah. To actually be able to achieve what a lot of people, and, and I'll ask your audience this, and you, how many times have you done something and either someone's turned around and gone, how the hell did you do that? Or even you, in the dark of night, sitting there with your old fashioned, and I have to apologize to everyone, it's like seven o'clock in the evening here in Los Angeles, so this ain't iced tea, I'm enjoying an old fashioned. But how many times you sit there and just go, I can't believe I just pulled that off. Yeah. How did I pull it off? And it's that passion and ignorance. And those two together, that's nuclear. But, that, but I think that's why we do it as well. That's what drives us is, you know, going up against the impossible and finding a way through. You know, like you look at us as human beings, I think that we're far more powerful than we ever give ourselves credit for. And yet, unless we push the status quo, unless we, we, we push or move towards something that we deem and see impossible, how will we ever know otherwise? You know, look at what Elon Musk has done and Steve Jobs and all these people, look at what they've done. Like how many people must have told them that they're completely stupid? You know, to come back to the conversation about parents, it's like often parents or family are say, saying these things because of, of a couple of reasons. One is what you mentioned. There's an aspect of them that is, is projecting their own resentment of, of never, you know, following something different in their life, right? The other aspect is wanting to keep you safe because to them it's like what, what's safe is what's, what's known. What's safe is what's been there all along. What's unsafe is you going out there and, and quitting as a bricklayer and doing something different. That's what's unknown. So if I may, I'd like to be an arsehole and name drop with a story, um, yeah, which I. is only there to help. You know, trust me. Um, I staggeringly still can't believe it, but I ended up working for Peter Diamandis and Elon Musk. Peter Diamandis was the founder of the X Prize, and Elon Musk is basically controlling the planet by now. Um, and I ended up doing a job for them where we were raising awareness for their, uh, bless you, for their private space program. Now, this was pre NASA, and it's in Hawthorne, just south of Los Angeles. And we did an event where we brought people into a couple of technology areas around uh, Los Angeles, including SpaceX. And it was only available to billionaires, and we had 30 people attend, and each one of them was billionaires, okay? When you look at the top 100 people in the planet, I think about 50% of our crowd was in that top list, okay? It was insane, the people that were there. And I had to go and get Elon for one end of uh, SpaceX and bring him into the board meeting where everyone was waiting for him. Now, I do a lot of private coaching as well, and two of my clients were at this event. And so, you know, you look after your own. I went, hey, I've got to go and get Elon. Do you want to tag along with me? And they're like, oh, yeah. And like little girls at a Justin Bieber concert, they came with me. So as we're walking through SpaceX back to the board meeting, I'm next to Elon. And I've met up with Elon uh, half a dozen times. Not the most personable guy on the planet. And next to me are my two guys. One of the guys next to me is just happy that he's walking down SpaceX with Elon Musk, all right? The guy on the far end is giggling, like trying to get a conversation going with Elon. And he's throwing everything out. So how did you do that? What did you think about it? How did that work? And it just being ridiculous, you know? He was getting close to the point of me having to lean over and go, hey, calm yourself. 
You know, he was getting close to that when the next bombshell came out of his mouth. Now, if you remember, NASA used to publicly humiliate Elon when he was doing the private space program. They used to literally go, there's no room for someone that's uneducated in this world to enter into the space industry. They were bastards to Elon Musk. Now, they're his biggest client and the only reason we're actually doing any form of transportation up into space. So my client turned around and he said, how do you feel that NASA, and at the time it was rumored, there was a team that NASA built just to basically attack anything that Elon did. It's never been proved, but there was a rumor that they actually instigated this team. And so my client pulled it out and went, how do you feel about this? Elon didn't even get put off his stride, didn't even look over to my client, but uttered the words, literally just turned around and said, hey, they'll always laugh at you before they applaud. And that was it. And I was like, whoa, that's pretty good. He even shut this kid up, which I'm happy about. But Elon Musk, there's a lot of people out there that look for the glory. You know, let's, let's, you know, let's call it as, as you know, like Richard Branson. He'd go to the opening of a Dunkin' Donuts if you paid him enough, you know? He, he loves that, okay? Elon doesn't care. He has no care what you think of him. He cares about what he does. Mm. And so I, I, I kind of look towards that kind of person. And I think most entrepreneurs, we thrive not on the money, but on the challenge. Yeah. If you want to, I've, I've, thought, I've often joked, if you want to see an entrepreneur go bankrupt, walk up to him and go, hey, I bet you can't do that for a hundred bucks. And then watch him get so giddy about the challenge, he'll spend 10 grand on doing it. When I spoke to Peter Diamandis, Peter Diamandis, he did the X Prize for the first reusable space vessel to go up, orbit, come back, refuel, and go back up again. And then it was bought out by Richard Branson. You know, we know that story. He paid $10 million as a prize to the first person that did it. Now, everyone knows that Richard Branson owns the Virgin Galactic, which was the first reusable rocket. They don't know that it was Bert Rattan that actually built it. What they also don't know is that Bert Rattan spent $90 million on building that vessel to win 10. <laughs> Now he won, think about all the others that failed that never even got a freaking shout out. So it's pretty amazing how as entrepreneurs, we rise to the challenge, not to the paycheck. It's, God, it's so true. Like I was just giggling because I was remembering all these moments of myself, I've been in that. And often I'll even bet myself, like I don't even need outside stimulation. Like I bet myself something and again, <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll spend thousands of dollars to make, make We've a couple all done of it. Yeah, we've all been we've there. Of, yeah, we've got a bunch of questions coming through. Keep them coming through. I want to get to those in a second. Before I do, though, I had a couple of couple more questions for you, Steve. So, first of all, like, like, how did you, how did you get into these circles, into these networks? Like, how did that all come about for you? Like, how did you transition from being this Irish lad, you know, bricklaying and doing the things that you're doing there, to being invited into being round round tables with Elon Musk and you know, Richard Branson and Elton John and so forth? Like, like, how did that happen? So I've never been invited to anything. Um, everyone's bastards. No one invites me to anything. Um, but I've, I found a way of actually m manipulating the situation enough to make sure that I'm needed in the room. Um, I started life realizing in England that as a, as a you know, big, thick Irish lad riding around on a motorcycle and being poor, you know, the classic cliche about you are the five people you associate with. I literally remember sitting in my pub and thinking to myself, all my friends are poor bikers. So by default, without me even analyzing it, I must be a poor biker. So if I change the four people that I'm staring at, then by default, I'm gonna be part of that. So I actually, through a friend of mine who was working at a stockbroker's, I talked my way into a stockbroking job. This is a whole story, just this is a whole podcast on its own with lots of whiskey. Um, so, but the short of it was, I got the job. Now mm. that's remarkable in itself. They transferred me from London to a new operation they were opening up in Hong Kong, okay? 
I landed on the Saturday, got drunk with him on the Saturday, got drunk with him on the Sunday, did orientation with him on the Monday at the Shangri-La, and then I was fired Tuesday morning. They realized I had no idea what I was doing. Now, I was hoping that by getting there, they would then start training me. And they decided to just cut me loose. So in a very, very dark moment, I was in an area called Wan Chai in the very early 90s, which was a seed. If any of you know Wan Chai, then you know, you know what you are. It's, it was the rough end of Hong Kong with all the dodgy girly bars and all that, and I'm in the middle of it. And there were some decent bars there, but not many. And I ended up being a doorman on one of them, thinking my life was over. But one thing happened, and again, this is the entrepreneurial journey. Whatever's thrown at us, we kind of clear away a little bit of the dirt just to see if we can find a sparkle of diamond. Now, I'm on the door of a nightclub. I've traveled from my girlfriend. I celebrate 33 years married to her today, uh, on Friday, okay? Wow. So I've been with her a long time. I've lied to her twice in my life. Once when I was in Hong Kong, when I got fired, and for six months I told her that everything was good, okay? And the second time was when I took her out for a surprise on her 50th birthday. Never lied to her other than those two times. And it still kills me, but hey-ho, that's you know, it's the facts and the facts. I didn't want to own up to it. But when I was on the door, I suddenly started seeing people coming towards me and I would play the game. I want, and we, can all, we all do this as entrepreneurs. I want to be him. I want to be him. That douchebag in the Ferrari, I don't want to be him. That guy over there trying to show off, you know, a fake Rolex, I don't want to be him. But that guy there that's just having a nice conversation with two very nice girls, I want to be him. And I remember the turning point. I, there was a bit of trouble in the bar. I had been called into the bar. The trouble had got sorted. I didn't even know where it was. But I'm now at the bar, and I'm off the door. And there's one of the waitresses in there that I knew. And there had been a bunch of guys that I'd regularly seen come in, always polite, always nice, all very well turned out, never showy, always respectful, quite chatty on the door, never ever would have any trouble with these guys. And they had corked up with a couple of girls that were absolutely cracking at their table. You know, when you've got a private table and the drinks are flowing, it's a magnet. So the girls came over, and I was sitting with them. And I saw these group of guys and these girls, I didn't really pay much attention to the girls. They were those kind of girls, but these guys were just having fun. You know, they weren't all handsy. There was nothing going on. They were more than likely going to go home alone because uh, they did every other time. Cause I used to see them leave, you know, mm. but they're in there with the girls and the waitress, the hostess walked over and she put the little leather wallet, you know, the little leather wallet with the, uh, the bar tab in it where they need your credit card. She put it on the table and then she went, oh, thank you very much, guys. You know, I hope you had a good night and came back to the bar where I was stood. Now, they hadn't seen her. Now, fair enough, it's loud music, dark lights, pretty girls. But the guy turned around and saw it and leapt up. Now, I was the doorman. I was cold stone sober. So anyone moves quickly in a club, it gets my reaction. So I quickly looked at him thinking, what is he doing? Is he going to argue about the bill? Is he going to argue about the tab? And he went, excuse me. And he didn't want to touch her. So he, he wasn't mauling. He was like, excuse me, excuse me. And so she turned around and he went, I am so sorry. I didn't see you put this down. Thank you so much for looking after me. He gets his credit card out of his pocket, shoves it in there. Didn't even look at the tab. Now, anyone that's even, anyone that's worked in nightclubs knows this. And anyone that's been to nightclubs knows this. The more you get drunk, a couple of extra drinks are put on that tap. You know, big surprise. I don't want to upset anyone, but that's what happened. I thought to myself, this guy, one, he treated this girl with such respect and was seriously apologetic that he hadn't paid her the consideration of gratitude. Mm. That impressed me. And he was so wealthy, he didn't have to call up his credit card company to know how much money, because I was that kind of guy. You know, I was walking around the grocery going, bag of bread, $2, pint of milk, $1. And you knew how much money you had on in your bank account before your credit card went, eh, eh. I was in that place. This guy was ordering drinks that he didn't care. Not didn't care, but it wasn't the priority. And, he mm. just, and I thought to myself, I want to be so rich that I can throw my card down on a tab without, not, without adding it up. 
And when he left and came back the following night with his group, with his uh, mates, and again, he left, he left alone, um, or they all left alone, should I say, I thought to myself, I want to talk to them. I want to be friends with them. And again, if I can make those four guys my friend, the average of the five, the average, pff, I'm going to be rich. So I started that, you know, hey guys, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, we're trying to find a good party. Let me see if I can find it for you. So all of a sudden, before Google, I became the oracle of all the best nightlife. Mm. And then what I started doing was I started taking over the clubs on quiet, uh, quiet nights and inviting the database that I had invited and that I had started to get to know. Then yeah. I started taking over penthouses, mansions, and all of a sudden I started working for Formula One teams, the Grammys, the Kentucky Derby. So before you knew it, I just thought, where's the next level? Where's the next gauge? Hmm. And it was literally just moving. Great apartment. Great apartment with a view. Penthouse with a view. You know, it just constantly went up. And that's how it started. Before you knew it, I had a Rolodex of people that I was solving. And that's the key. Hmm. I was never selling anything. I was solving your party requirements. And hmm. people would say to me, uh, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going over to Switzerland or I'm going over to London. There's this club, Tramps. I, I've never been out. Can you get me in? And I'll be like, sure, I can. It's going to cost you a thousand bucks, but, you know, I'll sort it out for you. And they would literally just cost, uh, stroke me a thousand bucks because they wanted someone else to be in front of the humiliation. And yeah. that's how it grew. Wow. Such a, such a fascinating story. And... I remember having a podcast interview with uh, Ray Blakely. He said, there's two types of entrepreneurs. There's the entrepreneurs that go out there and um, create things, right? And like your Elon Musk's, uh, your Richard Branson's and so forth. They, they create something, Henry Ford. And then there's entrepreneurs that just find problems to solve or notice things in their life. Like for you, it was like you had this dream, this desire to surround yourself with, with people that could lift up your experience of life. And yep. you noticed that, and it wasn't just the fact they had money, it was the way that they were respectful, the way that they treated people, which aligned with your values, that it's like, hey, I need to, to just be mates with them. Now, at that point in time, there was no idea where that would grow to. But again, no, you no. seized the opportunity and you kept following your nose and kept, I guess, stepping on stepstone after stepstone until you eventually ended up here uh, today. Huge net wealth of knowledge, massive network, and have lived some pretty phenomenal experiences. Um, I've got some questions here. And if you're watching live, welcome. Uh, please hit the like button. Let us know you're watching. Richard from Brisbane says, could Steve talk about his favorite mindset criteria for achieving big logistical projects like the one in the Vatican or Everest? Oh, that's very easy. Um, and I'm going to answer it with a story, if I may. Yeah, please. All right. So I had a client of mine that wanted to take his, his fiance and his mother-in-law well, future mother-in-law and father-in-law to a dining experience in Florence. Key word, experience. That's what I latched on. And I was actually working in Rome at the time, working for the Pope situation. And so I was already in Italy. So I was like, yeah, fine, I'll go and do that. So what we did was I made a few phone calls. Anyway, come to the Wednesday, I had the client picked up outside the Savoy in uh, uh, Florence in a horse-drawn carriage taken down through past uh, uh, Palazzo de Vecchio, past Diamo, past the gates of the Academia de Galleria, client jumps out, bangs on the door. Everyone in the carriage is looking at him like he's a psychopath because it's like nine o'clock at night. Bang, 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 bang. All of a sudden, doors open up. I had set up a table for five at the feet of Michelangelo's David in Italy. I had taken over the entire museum. And then while they were eating that pasta, I had a string quartet playing, and then halfway through, I had Andrea Bocelli come in and serenade them, okay? Here's the story, here's the important, that's pretty impressive, but the life lesson came what happened at about six o'clock that evening. I knew very powerful people, people that can make things happen by a text or a phone call. Okay, I'm a great believer that if you get a no, you're asking the wrong question or more times the wrong person. Okay, people with no power say no all day long. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's what I learned. They put this curator in charge of looking after me, and this curator 
to him, the academia was a sacred place. To me, it was a venue for a dinner party, you know? And he looked at me just like this flamboyant American kid that was just spending rich people's money. Mm. Perfectly accurate, all right? So I, that night, at about six o'clock, I was chatting with Veronica Bocelli, Andrea's wife, while Andrea is with the piano and his son, who was the pianist, just warbling and warming up and checking up with Aviva. It was, it, was it was an amazing scenario, you know, one that gave me goosebumps that I had pulled off. And my narcissistic quality came out. The curator who had basically given me friction, every time I would say to him, hey, can we have this done at three o'clock? You would be like, uh, uh, I don't know. Let me see. Let me see. And I'd be like, well, it's in two days' time. So can you tell me it's going to be done at three? Uh, I, I, let me see. Let me see. You know, he was just trying to aggravate me and trying to piss me off through this whole process. So I called him over to me because, again, it's rude, it's selfish, it's stupid, it's immature. I know, DM me or you hate mail. I'm fine with that. But the, I called the guy over to me and I wanted to give him a slap because he literally had made the last two days create a lot of friction where I didn't think he needed to do it. So I said to him, I said, hey, look at this, Andrea Bocelli, a worldwide musical icon, but a hero in Italy is about to sing at my dinner party. How amazing is that? And he's like, yes, it is amazing, it is amazing. I said, look at the table. We've got this amazing chef has done that. Isn't that amazing? And he was like, yes, it is amazing. I said, look, we've got that meal from that chef with Andrea Bocelli at the feet of Michelangelo. Please tell me you could not have a better experience for an Italian meal. Could you? And he was like, no, no, it is amazing. So I said to him, so I just wonder, how come I pulled it off? You know, I just wanted to give him a slap, you know, get him in his place that he had tried it. And literally the little bastard turned around to me and he went, no one's ever asked. And that was it. Now, the funny thing is, I crumbled. He knew he had got me. I literally bent over. And when I looked <laughs> up, he was just smiling his face off. We've been great friends ever since. We went out that night and had a steak and a few too many whiskeys. But the point is, we put parameters on ourselves by in the first, and reread that question. The question says big or impossible events and obstacles. The yeah. second you recognize something as big and impossible, you change your persona, you change your mindset. Getting married in the Vatican is literally arranging a public service in a public venue. Mm. If I said to you, hey, you know, I've heard from your mate and he wants to, he, he wants to get married in the local town hall, can you organize that? You'd probably go, yeah, because it's your local town hall and it's just a matter, you go and get a priest and you go and try, the Vatican is a public venue. Mm. Believe it or not, anyone can do it because it's a public venue. You've just got to know who the people are that can say yes. And that's what they drag their heels on. That's what they make tough. But at the end of the day, it's a public ceremony in a public venue. Quite simply, when you're going to do anything, stop looking at it as huge, massive and impossible. Belittle it. When I worked for the Grammys, I worked for a local concert music venue, you know, because I'm in LA, it's a local music event. You know, if I asked you, could you oversee the local school choir? What would you say? Probably yes. Yeah. If I asked you, can you oversee the Grammys? You'd probably be like, oh, no. but again, it's just a local music event. Yeah. Belittle the concept of what it is you're getting and you'll find you'll go further. Why should you be the one that says that it's too hard to achieve. Why should you be the one that says it's impossible? Let that be for the naysayers. Correct yeah. your mindset, belittle it, and as the old saying goes, how do you eat an elephant? Inch by inch by inch. God, I love that, Steve. It's like, you know, such a beautiful story of how our perceptions create our reality, you know, and, and I want to want to touch back on to where we started with this as well. And the conversation I had with a friend yesterday here 
is that often we put these people on pedestals or we put situations in these boxes that we deem, you know, big or impossible. The reality is this is our perception, right? We are all the same. You and I are no different. Neither is anybody else watching and listening to this right now, regardless of how much money they have in the bank, regardless of what they don't like. The difference between us is simply the decisions that you've chosen to make, right? The decisions mm. you've chosen to make, the actions you've chosen to take, which has got you to where you are right now, which has got me to where I'm right now. But the reality is, is we both start off with the same opportunities. Yet our perception, right, can create, our re does create a reality, either one of which can be scarce or one of which can be abundant. I guess the beautiful thing is, is that, you know, where you are right now has been an accumulation of 50, 52 years worth of decisions. For me, it's been 35 years worth of decisions. Right, regardless of, of whoever's watching this right now, whatever situation you're in, whether it be shitty or, or, or amazing, like you've created that. And if you've created that, you've also got the power to create something else. Mm. But you've got to change your mindset. You've got to change the way that you perceive what's going on uh, around you. Fantastic, guys. We've got, we've got enough time for one more question. I'm loving this, by the way, mate. Uh, Kathy from Sydney. Could Steve share briefly the three main ideas of blue fishing? Ask why three times. Never be the first call, be impossible to misunderstand. Wow, sorry, what was her name? Kathy. She's read your book, dude. Kathy, she has, isn't she? Jesus. Um, all right, so let's go in reverse, especially today. Okay. Yeah. We don't have a pandemic going on in the planet today. We have a period of mass confusion and distortion. No one knows what's going on, and that's the problem. If I asked anybody out there, do you think we will have COVID uh, or, or whatever it's called, do you think we will have it in two years' time? I can't believe there's anyone that would be out there that would say, yes, we would. They'll be like, oh, no, there'll be a vaccine. It'll be gone. Oh, we would have, you know, we'd all become a mute, whatever. We don't think it's going to be here to stay. But at this moment in time, that's not what's upsetting us. What's upsetting us is we don't know when it's going to stop. If I literally said to you on October the 1st at 9 a.m. in the morning, COVID's going to disappear, you would literally turn around and go, well, I've got to redo that bathroom. Oh, I've got to strum up on my guitar lesson. We would plan accordingly, but we have no idea. And yeah. that's what's upsetting us. So today we need transparency. And in business, we've needed it all along. And as we get more confusing with the illustrious life we put on Instagram and all of these kind of ways that we portray that our life is way more superior to yours, the bottom line of it is we're losing that connectivity. We're losing that relatability. So I've always said there's a difference between being easy to understand and impossible to misunderstand. When people meet me, literally nine out of 10 meetings that I've gone into, I've walked into leather jacket, black t-shirt, black jeans, and a crash helmet in my hand. Hello, ladies and gents, right, let's get to it. Crash helmet's on the table, let's get going. You're not retaining me to sleep with me. I'm not a prostitute. You pick someone far more attractive than me. I'm there to solve your problem. I'm there to provide the solution. So let's not worry about how attractive I look. Let's worry about what I bring to the table. Mm. That directness has lost me deals and it's gained me 20 more. And do you know the beautiful thing? We actually have to disperse a lot of energy in the day. Me and you, we've just met each other, okay? Now, I will tell you, I'm loving the questions. I'm loving the energy. But at the end of this conversation, I'm going to be a bit tired, you know, because we would have had this interview, and then I, 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 I'm at the end of the day. I'm drinking my old-fashioned. You're going to be the, the, the hay that breaks the camel's back, and I'm going to be all sleepy for the rest of the night. That's a given, Okay. Why should I spend any of my energy in the day trying to be someone I'm not? Mm. I don't want to confuse you. Let's ask, let's ask this question. Have you ever done business with anyone that you're confused with? Mm. No. Confusion is the big C of business. The big C of life is cancer. The big C of business is confusion. Never confuse your prospects. Show them who you are, what you are, and what you do. You do that, you've educated your prospect as to make a decision as to whether or not they get into your sandpit. So that's the, that's the element regarding um, the clarity. Mm -hmm. Then we go into the, um, 
I think it was uh, the three wise. Is that correct? Well, it'll never be the first call. All right. Okay. So I'm going to go into the three wise at the end for a story. Okay. If I, if I may, I need your permission. Of course you can. <laughs> All right. Okay. So I, if I, and this is probably a perfect example. If I had contacted you two weeks ago and gone, hey man, you know, I want to be on your podcast. I'm a big deal. Would you have had me on your podcast with that intro? Possibly not. You might not have made it past the screening. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So let me do, and I've done this on stage before. Picture this. You walk into a bar, okay? And I walk up to you and I go, hey, how you doing? I'm Steve Sims. I've worked with Elton John, Elon Musk, the Pope. I've made some shit happen. I'm quite a big deal. How you doing? And I stick my hand out to shake your hand. What is your response? I'm going to stick my hand out and shake your hand. Are you? You're going to punch me in the nose and call me an arrogant prick? Depends how many drinks I've had. Yeah, bingo. This <laughs> is, it's, an, it's an arrogant way of introducing yourself, isn't it? It's precocious. It's self-promoting. I guarantee you there's a lot of people out there listening. If they were just listening to that example or heard that in a pub, they'd be like, oh, that guy's off, a mate. prick. Yeah, he's full of himself. But let's change the situation. Let's change the narrative. I walk into a bar and I ignore you. Why shouldn't I? I don't know you. I walk to the end of the bar and I order my old fashioned. And Darius, a mutual friend of ours, he elbows you in the ribs and says, hey, you see that guy over there? He's worked with Sir Elton John, Elon Musk and Richard Branson. He's worked with the Pope. That guy's quite a big deal. Now watch your response. Probably going to want to come over and buy you a drink. I never make the first phone call. I never make the introduction because I want to walk in with credibility. So when I wanted Andrea Bocelli, I had never worked with Andrea Bocelli before, but I've just finished working eight years for Elton John. So I got Elton John to phone up Andrea Bocelli. You think Andrea Bocelli is going to want to work with me when he gets a phone call from Elton John? Mm. So try it now. This, that's an exasperated experience. Look at who you know on Facebook and who you're trying to get hold of. And then look at who their mutual friends are and then pick one of those to make you the introduction. When you are introduced by someone that they class as credible, you walk in with power already. So mm -hmm. never be the first call. Always get someone else to do it for first. Year. Okay? Yeah, love that. Now, the last one. And it was, was it Cynthia? Am I? Uh, Kathy. Did I get it? it was Kathy. Sorry, Kathy, I apologize. All right, so I'm going to give you a story now as to why you need to ask why three times. I want to solve your core problem, but you're one of these weird things called a human being. And you don't want to tell me what really motivates you. You don't want to tell me what really gets you excited because you're scared. You don't want to be vulnerable. We're those people, okay? We're very primitive. We are the slowest evolving technology in the planet. The bloody toothbrush has evolved more than human beings over the same period of time. So I get a phone call. I had an office in Palm Beach. And one of my girls get a phone call and she went, there's something funny about this guy on the phone. Can you take it? Yeah, sure, put it through. So I went, hey, how you doing? It's Steve Sims, how you doing? What do you need? And he said, um, hey, I believe you're working with Elton John. I said, yes, I am. What do you need? He said, I want to get a photograph with him. I want to get a selfie. So I said, oh, great. That sounds absolutely fantastic. Why? So he goes quiet a little bit because that's, that's quite a confrontational word. People are often quite scared of the word why. So he, he waits a second. Then he comes back and he goes, well, He's an icon, he's big, he's famous, you know, he's one of the last big guys out there. He's not doing any more tours after this one and, uh, you know, he's going to die soon. So I want to get a selfie with him. Okay. Thank you very much. Let me see what I can do and I'll call you back. I didn't call him back. Okay. There was no depth to the request. It was all superficial. So a month went by. One of the girls paged a call through to me up in the office and they said, hey, do you remember that guy that called us about a month ago? And I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the guy for, yeah. Um, someone else is on the phone wants the exact same thing. 
I'm kind of thinking it's his mate that's trying a different angle because you've ignored him. Can I put it through to you? And I went, yeah, put it through to me. So I'm thinking it's, it's a mate of this guy. All right. So this guy gets on the phone. He says, hey, how you doing? That's Steve. Yeah, this is Steve Sims. I believe you work with Elton John. Yeah, I work with Elton John. Yeah, I want to get a selfie with Elton John. I want to meet Elton John in uh, Hollywood. I said, oh, that's fantastic. Why? And he goes quiet. And then he turns around and he says, uh, well, uh, he's one of the greats, one of the best, one of the last living icons. You know, there's not many people that can just have one name and you know exactly who he is. One of the rock stars, the superstars. Uh, you know, he doesn't have many more years left. I want to get a photograph with him and I want to, I want to quickly chat with him. And there's things. And it was the way his voice tailed off at the end. You know, everything else was kind of a bit perky and there's things. And I went, what things? Real quiet. As Chris Voss says, uh, your midnight DJ voice. What things? Shut up. Leave it alone. Let him answer. And he came back to me as a different person. He came back to me and he went, my dad used to take me to school. Every day he would drive me to school. Every day he'd be there to pick me up. And we had this old shitty car and it had a cassette in there and it was broke. We couldn't get the cassette to eject. And it was Elton John's greatest hits. And on the way to school, we had Elton. On the way back, we had Elton. And do you know what we did from the early ages? We used to sing our hearts out to whatever Elton was singing. I knew that cassette backwards within my first three years. And he got a new car and it had a DVD player in it. And do you know what my dad did? He bought Elton John's greatest hits and continued the trend. On the way there, we would sing Elton John. On the way back, we would sing Elton John. And then I went into high school. And in your high school years, you hate your parents. They're no longer cool. My dad would sing Elton John and I would ignore him. I would be looking out the window, maybe humming sometimes, but I wouldn't let him see me hum. But he would sing Elton John all the way there and all the way back until finally I had a car and I didn't have to go with him anymore. My mum never took me to school. My dad, every day there, every day back, every day, Elton John there, every day back. Now my dad's been dead about 25 years. But every time I'm driving to an appointment, driving down the highway, driving my kids to school, whatever, and the radio's on, and Elton John comes on the radio, my dad is sat in that passenger seat next to me, screaming out on John, singing his hearts out to those lyrics. I want to meet Elton John and thank him that for three minutes, every now and then, he brings my dad back to me. That's the why. Now, if any of you are out there slightly tearing up, I have tried to resist. I, that happened seven years ago. I still cry my shit out every time I tell that story. I introduced him to Elton John introduced him on a small premise of that story. He told the story. They both cried and hugged. And I'm not kidding you, there wasn't a freaking dry eye for like five feet around those people. If you can get to the core to understand what really is motivating the question, not superficially, because we've already realized we parameter that. We go, well, I'd really like to do this. We don't want to sound stupid. We don't want to sound an idiot and tell you the real reason. Use your Sherlock Holmes. Ask him why three times to get down into that core and understand the real problem that you need to solve, the real why as to what you're going to provide. Mm. Kathy, I hope that answers your question. Kathy, fantastic question. Uh, Steve, man, what an incredible last uh, almost hour it's been chatting to you. Uh, I, I thoroughly, <laughs> thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. And there's been so many amazing points that you've shared uh, today, which I really hope resonated with, with each and every one of you guys that are watching, whether it be live or uh, on the recording as well. Please show your support, uh, start a watch party, share this across your feed, because there's a lot in what's been shared today that I think can cut to the core um, of what's really going on out there for entrepreneurs and help them to accelerate and move forward. And Steve, you're a testament to that, mate. You're an amazing human being that I can tell has made a huge impact on so many people's lives. So thank you so much for being here today. Uh, thank you everyone for watching and uh, I look forward to seeing you on the rest of uh, the Freedom Series sessions. Steve, too, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me.
Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Game Changers podcast. Uh, there's a couple of things I'd love you to do to help us and help yourself to spread the message further. Uh, make sure that you like the Game Changers on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, please subscribe by clicking the link below to ensure that you keep up to date with the weekly episodes we uh, share here at the Game Changers podcast with amazing entrepreneurs and business owners around the world. And of course, like if you're in a position where you may be overwhelmed with business or looking for a way to grow faster and more effectively, and you realize that the key to success is being surrounded by amazing people who have been there and done that before, I'd like to invite you to apply to have a game plan session one-on-one -on -one with one of my team here at The Game Changers. There's no cost if you get through. Uh, all that we ask is that you are doing a minimum of $250,000 per year to really be able to utilize the strategies and tactics and the mindset shifts that we share with you, uh, that you're coachable, that you're a decent person and you're, you know, you're willing to take on board some advice. If not, that's totally cool. Uh, but I know for me, I wouldn't be where I'm right now without the support of so many mentors and coaches and resources along the way. And I'd like to pay that forward and give back to you the opportunity to work with uh, us one-on-one -on -one for free to put together a customized game plan. And the reason we're doing this is a couple of things. Number one is that sometimes it's just the smallest thing that can make the biggest difference. And uh, I think that entrepreneurs and business owners have the opportunity to change the world. And if we can maybe help you to, to make the smallest shift to change your life and your world, uh, you're changing ours in return. The second thing is that we are always looking for amazing clients to work with and to welcome into and invite into the Game Changers community. And so if at the end of the call, you do feel that there's a huge amount of value there, uh, that we fit, feel that there's a great value fit there, we can have a conversation about working together. But uh, this game plan call, there's absolutely no obligations to work with whatsoever. Allow us to help you with uh, the years and years and years of, of knowledge that we have in growing and scaling great companies. Companies. And uh, I think that uh, business owners are the future of the world. If there's a way that we can help you to create a better business, more profit, more fulfillment, more fun, I would love the opportunity to do that now. So click the link below, book your game plan session, make sure you follow us on social and start today with the latest episodes of the Game Changers podcast. My name's Barry William McGinnity. Thank you so much for your support and look forward to seeing the next one. Bye for now.